is uh, going to present um, cybersecurity myths. And on December 2nd, Peter Peterson will return to share some of his work on adversarial thinking. I'd like to remind everybody that the next application deadline for SFS scholarships is uh, November 15th. It's a, a great scholarship if you would like to work for government. Uh, we will also be holding a scholarship competition round for the DOD CYSP scholarships. And for that scholarship, you have to apply both to um, Scholarship Retriever and to the DOD site uh, by their deadline, which is coming up soon. Uh, for SFS, you apply only to the UMBC um, uh, Scholarship Retriever site. Okay, without further ado, um, uh, we have uh, Russ Fang from APL Labs. Hi, uh, good, good morning, good afternoon. I'm Russ Fink. I'm with the Applied Physics Lab, which is right down the road in Laurel, Maryland. Perhaps you've heard of us. We are a UARC, which is a university affiliated research center. And uh, for those SFS scholars, we can be one of the places where you fulfill your obligation of employment. <laughs> so just uh, throwing that out there in case anybody's interested or soon to be on the market. Let me share the screen here. Hopefully that's working. Okay, that looks like it is. Fantastic. So what I'm here to talk about is this idea called armor and not just about armor itself, but actually how the idea came about and how we actually got to a point of commercializing this. So that was, uh, let's see, hide that little thing there. Good. I get a nice little preview. Dual monitors are underrated let me tell you all right so today whoops so anyway just this is about me these are the kind of screens that we throw up while people are trying to join the webex because i know the first five minutes of every meeting are typically lost but anyway i've got my phd from umbc in 2010 my advisor was dr alan sherman and i also had a fellow on the committee named david challoner who was actually uh, one of the inventors of the trusted platform module. So that was a lot of fun, actually. And my dissertation work was finding trustworthy approaches to electronic voting. And I worked closely with Dr. Sherman and also Dr. Richard Carback, some other uh, people that were in the cyber defense lab. Uh, as a plug, I would say if you're doing a dissertation, your best bet is to try to buddy up with somebody, not just for ideas and information, but also to make sure you are hitting the correct dates and get reminders about all the procedures and forms you have to fill out and things like that. So it's always good to have like a dissertation buddy. Anyway, uh, so from that work, I learned about trusted platform modules and in, larger, in a larger sense, I learned about trusted computing. And there's this industry consortium called the Trusted Computing Group. And a lot of that technology is featured in this innovation that I'm about to talk to you about now. All right, so for today, I'm gonna to give you an overview of what Armor is, and then I will talk about the invention to investment pipeline and what that looks like at a large UARC. And uh, it's not pretty, but it's not ugly either. So we'll go through that and talk about some lessons learned. So Armor is a kind of a backronym for Autonomous Recovery from Malware Ransomware. I meant to change that slide. It's actually now being called Autonomous Resilience and Machine Recovery. The reason being is that we're not putting the emphasis on malware and ransomware so much as we are about machine recovery for whatever reason. As we know, ransomware is everywhere. You can't throw a stick without hitting a newspaper vending machine that has some front page article about somebody getting hit by ransomware. It's a terrible thing to, to think about. And what's even worse is, what can we do about it? So our current solutions right now are, well, you can rely on cloud-based backups, and that's great. The problem with cloud backups is that to do a restore, you have to get back to the cloud. I just went through a technology refresh at APL a few months ago where I got a new laptop. It took me at least a week to get the core capabilities back, which includes installing LaTeX, installing Python, Miniconda, 
fonts, configurations, getting the software right, re-entering the license keys, even transferring my bookmarks over. All these things tended to be a real hassle. So I could only imagine what would happen if something happened in my system and it got erased or compromised somehow and I needed to get my system back before the compromise. Well, today that simply means, yeah, I could get all my data files back, but I'd have to go through the pain of reconfiguring everything. If you multiply that by a thousand, which would be reflect a, a large organization getting hit by ransomware, that's just a whole lot of lost hours and productivity. And what you do get back will never exactly be the same as what you had before. Other things you can do include try to prevent the malware. Well, that's great. You know, signatures are something that antivirus products have, but they're not always up to date. And advanced adversaries are able to evade signatures and deploy malware regardless. There are some products out there that do ransom key recovery. Those things are dicey. They have to catch the ransomware in progress in order to extract the key out of memory and be able to squirrel that away somewhere so that after the attack, you can just use the key, decrypt it, and tell the ransomware people to go away. Full OS rebuild I talked about. Security hardened OSs. So once you do get a system back, maybe you, know, you wanna try to harden the operating system. Well, let me tell you, those are really hard to use. And of course, the more you lock down a system, the more you lock out legitimate users from features that they need to get their job done. Because of this, people are now starting to pay the ransom. They have cyber insurance. People will pay the ransom. It's absolutely horrific that people should pay the ransom. But in some cases, they feel that the money spent on recovering the key is a lot better than trying to go it alone and do recovery on their own and go through that entire pain. In fact, it used to be that when you paid the ransom, you had no idea you were getting the key back. Well, I'll tell you, I've done some reading recently. Ransomware criminals are actually very keen on recovering your system because as a group, if many times their software does not give you your files back, if you aggregate that over the long run, people are gonna stop believing the criminal's ability to recover their files and therefore they will stop paying the ransoms. So to keep this industry up, they have to maintain a certain level of customer service, which is absolutely disgusting, but it's what they do and it's how they keep the cash flow coming. The problem is anytime you pay a ransom, it only encourages the behavior and the uh, problem will never go away. So what do we do about this? Well, this is, our little contribution to it, it's called Armor. That is, uh, of course, uh, autonomous resiliency and machine recovery. It's very simple. It's a local on-disk backup and recovery solution. It takes full snapshots of the operating system. These get saved into a secure vault. The vault is secured by uh, Opal self-encrypting uh, hard drives. And essentially, that's a trusted computing hardware enforced read-only attribute that's set on a certain portion of the hard drive that ensures that you can see some data in that partition or whatever, but you can't overwrite it. And that means malware can't overwrite it either. And so what we have is essentially a self-contained backup and recovery solution that is hardware protected by trusted technologies. It ensures you can always boot, you can always get back to where you were, and all of this happens within a matter of minutes. All right, so the armor design, basically we have trusted hardware. So I've talked about the Opal hard drive. You can see here, there's a Samsung 960 Pro. All the Samsung SSD NVMe hard drives have Opal in them. Opal is a standard that was originally created for whole hard drive encryption for data at rest protections, but it also has this kind of read-only feature that you can access with the right software and a password to be able to you know, what we do is we use it to manage a vault where we can, you know, lock the vault during normal operations, unlock the vault during backup operations, do a full disk imaging, and then relock the vault. We call it uh, recovery being fast, local, and complete. It's fast because it takes merely a couple of minutes, several minutes. Well, that's like saying, you know, uh, uh, Leesburg is minutes from DC. You know, it takes about 20 or 30 minutes to do a recovery and a backup for 512 gigs. It's pretty fast when you consider you're getting the system back that you originally left. Every bell whistle, every password, 
every configuration, all your LaTeX fonts, everything all, all like that comes right back. It's local because your recovery is from a local hard drive. It's not across the network or anything like that. And complete means, yeah, we get everything back. So as far as a kind of a screenshot demonstration, if you will, I'm gonna walk through just a couple steps. We have an initial infection, then we'll recover the uh, main operating system in minutes, and then we reboot to the restored system. And uh, I'll talk about this butter dish diagram here in, in a little bit. So the first point is that we will go through an initial infection. So what we have with Armor is we essentially have a, you know, the, the user area, which is the user data apps full operating system. This is fully writable. You know, you can do anything you want to hear. Uh, and malware and bad actors can also do anything they want there. But normally you're working in here, you're creating your documents, you're you're editing your code or what have you. All right. Uh, what we have on the side is actually the armor partition, which consists of a read only enforce area that has its own recovery operating system. It's based on Fedora and its own vault, which can actually be used to plaster back over this entire uh, user's operating system over here on the left. All right. So let's look at infection and see what that looks like. So here we are with a desktop. Now these are actual pictures from an infection that I deliberately ran. It's called Shino Locker, S-H-I-N-O-L-O-C-K-E-R. That is a white hat piece of ransomware that was developed about 2012 and publicized on Usenix for the purpose of people doing research against ransomware. So it was meant to act, behave, and uh, even have the same data structures and things as real ransomware. The only difference is they don't charge you anything for the key. So if you do lose your data, you can get the key back. Well, that's not the point. So the point for me is to show that we have ransomware, it's taken over, it's encrypted all the files. And so what do we do? We immediately shut down and we boot to armor. So what we're gonna do is we're going to recover that main OS and that involves first doing a hard reset of the machine, powering on, selecting the armor as the boot environment. You get this, Super deluxe, very easy and friendly to use NCURSES interface, which is basically our our act of investing in the parts that matter, not the interface. <laughs> Although interface is very important. But uh, we go and we choose to restore everything. We pick a last known good date that it was all working and we commit to it and say, yep, go ahead and do it. So what restoration does is it starts by restoring the bootable areas, which in this case is the partition table, the EFI partitions, and it'll march down through all the different partitions, restoring them block by block. And it proceeds in, uh, this is an old screenshot. It actually runs along at about 25 gigabytes per minute, which means you can recover a full, well, you know, go from there, uh, 30 to 40 minutes to, rec for, to recover a uh, full 512 gigabyte partition. And uh, once you do that, then you basically shut down, reboot back into your normal operating system and voila, everything comes back exactly as it was before the infection. Now note here that we still have the initial infection vector there, it just hasn't triggered yet. So if you run into trouble, this is almost like playing video games or something where you save your game before you go and fight the big boss, all right? If you then boot this up and it still fails, well, you just do another recovery and then come back in and try to remediate the virus. You can repeat this cycle as often as necessary until you get it right. So once again, what you're doing is you are going back in time. This is almost like a hardware snapshot, okay? You're going back in time and you're saying, uh, find the, the date that I think the last good known state of the system was, revert to that, recover to that. Oh, and yeah, if I had to go back a week, I might have lost some files. Well, that's where you use your cloud-based backup to pick up the changes that I made since last week. And usually cloud-based backups are pretty good like that. But all your software will come back, your files, your licenses, your bookmarks, your remembered passwords. Uh, even like one thing I had a fight with on my tech refresh was, you know, my desktop icons came back, but they were all in different places. So I'm used to icons being in a certain spot. I had to like manually recover that. It might not be a big deal, but I'll tell you every five or 10 minutes that you spend on that is five or 10 minutes that you can't be doing valid work or something else. 
All right. So where we are, so there's a thing in the industry called technology readiness level, thanks to NASA. Uh, so we consider ourselves at a TRL-6, which is that we have an actual working version. It's just on a small scale right now. I'm using it on the computer that I'm driving this display from right now. And my family will attest I have about seven laptops sitting around and probably uh, a one to two dozen of these Opal drives sitting around that are in various stages of, of build. So, so that's a lot of fun. And uh, we are ready for initial pilots. And uh, in fact, we've got, this is an older slide, so I do have some updates on that. All right, so the summary of, of Armor is ransomware isn't going anywhere. It's a lucrative business. And uh, as long as people pay the ransom, they're gonna keep going on that. You know, current solutions are not enough, but Armor can apply a very critical endpoint recovery, not just endpoint defense, but endpoint recovery solution, which will help especially small and medium businesses, home users, things like that, get back up and running right away. And so that fulfills our ultimate vision, which is get everybody back to where you were in a very short amount of time and keep going. And eventually ransomware will become a thing of the past. All right, before I go on, any questions about armor up to this point? Any comments? Russ? Yeah, hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh the, is the Opal drive uh, like a, a, what do you call the solid state uh, USB stick? Yes. So this, pop back up. We have two, two variations of this. We do have this on what we're calling a sidecar, all right, which is a standalone USB hard drive. Okay. So you have an entire drive inside of here. It's uh, one terabyte. They can be different sizes, but we're going with a terabyte. And you can uh, deploy this as a standalone unit, which you plug in and you leave plugged in, and it can do its own backups onto its own storage, right? That's, that's one way to go. The other thing that we've been doing very recently is we have what we call an embeddable version of this, which is it starts off as a sidecar, you go to your target computer that you that you want to work with you do an initial backup and then you take this you take the hard drive out of here and install it into your uh target replacing the hard drive with this this armor drive and then do a recovery and then what that does is that automatically converts your system into a dual boot system where one of the sides is your operating system that you have full control over and the other side is armor with the vault on it. So it becomes a kind of a baked in thing. And what that looks like is, uh, let's see, I can show you a picture of it here. If you, maybe you can see my screen. Share, yeah, we're sharing, right? Can everybody see this? Yes. Hopefully, yeah. Um, so what we are showing is uh, here we are with, um, oh, and I learned a trick. If you do Windows button, pad shift plus, you can actually magnify your screen. That's pretty cool. Can everybody see the magnified version of this? Yeah. So we have here my regular disk, which is 500 gig disk. But on the other side of it, I have this other 500-ish gigs set aside for the armor drive. And then here's my vault. So this is what this looks like. I take system images. It's right there on disk. And I can recover going back to... Uh, well, I had a little glitch, so I can go back to October 28th, which was last week. But I can store close to a month worth of daily backups on here. And uh, among other innovations we've had to do is uh, making the concept of a full uh, image. Actually, I'm going to try to scroll over here. A full 512 compresses down to about 135 gigs. And then we also have a delta algorithm that creates deltas going backward in time. So I can store previous days worth of backups by maintaining small delta files, which I start with the most recent one and apply a binary patch going backward in time to get back to whatever state I want. So that's part of the innovation here is, is not just the fact that we're doing the backups, but we're actually maintaining uh, deltas to, to do that. Thanks. Back out here. 
sure. And by the way, this is all read only. If I if I try to edit this or delete it, it'll it'll complain. It's actually there's no no delete option here. Link at me. All right. Okay, so that's armor. It's it's fast, it's simple, it's a very easy idea, but then the big question is, well, how long did it take us to get here and what did that actually start life as? So here is the timeline of armor, and I'll walk through this a little bit. We had this idea way back in 2015. I give the original, well, the original credit belongs to, to uh, Dr. Challoner who had this idea. There were essentially four of us going to some mandatory meeting. You know, when you work at an organization, they have these all hand meetings and people get kind of bored. And so they had a break. And so we sat out of the break and Dave, Dave comes up to us and says, Hey guys, you got about two minutes. We're like, sure. And uh, we go into a room and he starts whiteboarding this idea. He says, I've got this idea to solve ransomware. He says, all we need to do is take the Opal drive, make it read only, and we can do backups and protect the backups against overwrites. Great. It's a five second idea. It takes five seconds to explain that idea and then seven years to make it happen. <laughs> All right, so he, he drew that, that diagram on the whiteboard. We filed what's called an invention disclosure, which is generally your organizations, wherever you work. If you invent something, you fill out a small, you know, three to five page explanation of what it is. You turn it into your APL property people, to your property people, and they, they're like, okay, great. And then there are meetings and more meetings, and we talk about what's the commercial appeal of this? Can we license this to somebody? You know, do you need money to help develop it? Yes, we do. And so that leads into kind of internal development where we got some essentially research money to go look at this. While at the same time, going internally and externally to try to find people that might want to license the idea, All right? Uh, we got a patent filed on this back in 2016 and it was issued in 2018, so that's number 10, you know, million oh forty nine, blah blah blah. I've got a plaque on it in my wall somewhere, and uh, and that's that's exciting. So we actually have a patent on this idea. Well, then, a couple of years later, let's see, uh, we will have we, we get a licensee. So there's this company in the UK. It's stood up by a single person, and uh, he he came to license the the technology. So. APL kind of reaches out to all these different sort of angel investors and groups and things like that. And they have a mission to basically say, uh, you know, who is interested in our technology? So as you can understand, APL covers a wide variety of domains from space, electronics, cybersecurity, uh, aerospace systems. I mean, just, just lots and lots of power generation systems, lots and lots of, of areas. And we have a lot of people filing patents and making licensable technology for material science, space, propulsions, electronics, software, and then of course cybersecurity. And so we are in that sort of uh, stable of, uh, of possible ideas. And we happen to find a licensee, somebody who is willing to come and license this from APL. So that, that fellow came along in 2019, we got the license stood up. And then for the ensuing years, then it became this idea of trying to shop the idea around and trying to see where it sticks. So one of the problems, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we lead into 2022, where now we're starting to actually see things happen. And, and that's great. Let me skip to a couple of slides here. All right. So what does this look like? How, how good do I feel about this process? All right. Well, at the beginning, it was a promising start. You know, we had this world winning idea. It was a five second idea. We could explain the idea in five seconds. It seemed easy. All right. That's great. So then we had the idea. We started banging out some code. That was another issue, more or less a nightmare, as it were, because there's very little code. People don't really know about the read only feature of the Opal drives. There's only one group making software that actually does this. And it requires like extensive Linux knowledge to be able to make the thing work. So anyway, we started doing that in 2016. We had good development, a busy team, but then we had some positioning issues. All right, so I'll talk about that. So the internal outreach, we went to our IT department and said, hey, you know, got this thing, it can solve ransomware. 
Well, at the time, they were pushing their own kind of cloud-based backup solutions. And they were a little concerned, well, what does this mean? Do I have to, uh, you know, buy hard drives for everybody? Do I have to install new hard drives in 15,000 computer systems? Like, what is that going to involve? We didn't have answers back then either, because back then we didn't have this external form factor. We were talking about having to specifically configure every laptop and do some stuff on them. And we didn't have answers for that. So that really turned, turned them off. All right. As we move along from there, we also had, we got a licensee, but guess what? We didn't really get a whole lot of funding. We didn't have uh, the, the sort of you know, dwell time that was necessary to really turn this thing out quickly. So we all kind of continued on a very low sort of sort of uh, trajectory on that. 2020 came around and we ran into, we had some good things, we had some bad things. The bad thing, of course, was COVID. That has been kind of a game changer that will linger, its effects will linger for decades to come. But nonetheless, that happened. We did get invited to do some virtual briefs some briefs to the Department of Energy, InfoSec World. Now I get spam all the time, but that's okay. And we got some pilots going in 2022. So that's been really exciting. We have one government customer that's interested in piloting this, possibly another government customer. And then of course, Syntegra has their own commercial deployment that they've done. Very limited, but it's it's really starting to take off. This thing could you know blossom in a matter of a couple of months. So we'll have to see. But the reason for this talk today is, you know, why did this thing take seven years? Why did it take seven years? It seems like a long time, right? We hear about Elon Musk, you know, snapping fingers and making Tesla appear in a matter of like three or four months. We hear about, you know, Jeff Bezos and things like that. We hear about Facebook, all these different advancements. People can just sim simply conjure technology out of thin air in just months. Well, for the rest of us, the problem is that if you work at a UARC or any company, and there are many very good companies around here, not just government, but you know, there's the Northrop Grumman's, the Lockheed's, things like that. You know, if you're hired to work at a company, chances are it's because they want you to do what they want you to do, not what you want to do. So if you're lucky enough, a company will grant you some opportunity to explore your own ideas, even if they are game changing, but that's not your focus. And so I would have to estimate that over the past seven years, I've had probably an aggregate less than 5% of dwell time to be able to work on this. 5% is not that much. When you think about a 40 hour work week, 5% boils down to about two hours or so a week over seven years. And some years there's been no work, other years there's been a lot of work. You know, it's not been a linear progression of things. It's been, you know, fits and starts. Get to this point, get to this point, get busy on something else and things like that. So we don't have that sort of dwell time that's necessary to make this technology very quickly. Now we've benefited from it too, because we can pay attention to what's going on in industry. We can pay attention to changes in operating systems, changes in the TPM, things like that. Now everybody has a TPM 2.0 because of Windows. Actually, thank you Windows, because TPM 2.0 is actually a lot better. And, and so we, we're adapted to work with that solution. Also in seven years, so David Challoner retired, all right? So we lost like one of the big other champions. And so I'm kind of the one doing all this now. And we're, I'm trying to indoctrinate a couple other people back at the lab to be able to help me out with this, but they are coming up to speed. Uh, I happen to be a combination of a bash programmer, a, a Fedora aficionado. I can say successfully, I understand system D and uh, start, you know, bringing your pitchforks and, and burning your torches because I actually can almost like system D a little bit. <sighs> there, I said it. Um, go ahead, brand me as, as disloyal. But uh, so there's, there's all this kind of specialty knowledge. It's, it's awfully hard to change to, to transfer over when you have 5% availability. So some, some of the lessons, so that's our timeline. And, and this is sort of the excuse chart of, you know, what's been happening. I mean, there's good and there's bad, right? So what are the lessons learned out of this? So this is where, you know, I want to kind of, you know, give, give you my theories on, on life and how that works. 
So the problem with innovating in an organization such as APL, and I don't mean to impugn APL, you know, we're a great place to work, but I've worked at other places and the result is always about the same. When you're hired by a place, they need you to do what they need you to do, not what you want to do, all right? So when they, so based on, on this, the armor development cycle has split my focus. So when you have internal research and development, that's what IRAD is, generally speaking, if your company has an IRAD program, generally speaking, they try to target you around the 20% level of effort. That means during a given week, at most one day can be spent on your IRAD. And they also have about, in their mind, a target of say about a six month period of performance. So IRADs are meant to be little projects that kind of you know, vet whether an idea is possible. If it's possible, then it goes on and they try to shop around to a government customer to pick up the research, which is really hard to do. Ideally, if we had our choice, we would rather go full bore on this thing for about three months, just pound it in, get the whole thing done. But organizations don't normally work with that like that. Another issue is that, you know, playing multiple roles, that's a really challenging thing. So what we need here is we have one person that has the idea and we have that same person is responsible not just to develop the technology and solve the problems, but also to market, strategize, get this in front of people, be the champion of it, be the person that knocks on the doors, right? That's not possible when you have 20% and you've got other things to do. It really becomes difficult. And finally, I'll take this on my own uh, self. You know, follow through is really hard, okay? Following up on leads, somebody gets you a, call, a contact in the Navy or somebody gets you a contact in the Department of Energy. Okay, you've got to follow up on that. You have to send emails. And by sending emails, it's not just send an email, get a meeting and done, but take action items after the email, call them back. If you haven't heard from them in six months or even three months, call them back, email them. Don't let it drop. That's a really hard thing to do when all you want to do is sit down and work out this crazy bash bug that you have that results in your backups being wiped out when it runs out of space, all right? That's a problem. And so what I'm actually gonna say here is I've come up with this term called salesperson scientist, all right? This is a new role where what we need to be, if we're going to be innovators at all, we, we like to focus on the science, we like to do the development, but we also have to be salespeople here too. So just having an idea and working on that idea is never enough. You also have, have to be able to sell the idea to people who maybe don't live at your level. Maybe they don't understand technology. They don't know what system D is and they can't think on that level. You have to bring them to the idea in terms that they can understand. And this is a, a challenge. I'm not a good salesperson scientist, but I would also argue very few people are. So if you can manage to work toward that goal of becoming a salesperson scientist, that's where you can make the most benefit. And you have to really balance both. It can't just be heavy on one and heavy on the other. I know a lot of people that are heavy on one and heavy on the other. And we'll know the people that always come in and they talk about this great idea, but they don't have anything behind it. Yeah, they're more salesperson than scientist. But uh, achieving that balance is really critical. So with these lessons learned, you know, I do want to emphasize this is not unique to APL. Other organizations have this kind of an issue going on. Also, it's not a problem that can really be fixed, you know, nor should it be fixed, all right? What makes you valuable to your organization is the, your ability to do what they need you to do, whether that's solving sponsor problems, whether that's defending the integrity of the nation or doing mathematical research. I know there are a lot of people here that to do mathematics research and there's you know, some really good companies around the area that you all work at, a lot of good government customers, but that comes with the territory. So just being in that, in that area, I know you have ideas, I know you have good ideas, but you're going to have these kinds of challenges and you just have to kind of you know, work toward them. They, they just have to be worked at. Of course, all this needs awareness, patience and things like that. And also, relish the downtime, you know, when you're not working on your idea, always, you know, I keep a stack of notes, paper notes. I have scrap paper from the printer that comes out and I have, have a whole folder of notes 
right here. I mean, many, many pages, probably at least 50, 60 handwritten pages in here that I keep on this. And periodically I go through and review the notes when I get a minute, what action item, what thing do I need to fix, things like that. So in summary, ransomware, okay, that's here to stay. Count on an invention to investment cycle that has a very long cycle time. And uh, I think it was uh, what Einstein is credited with saying that inspiration, you know, the, the whole innovation process is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. I also have a, a little tag that I got out of a Chinese fortune cookie <laughs> that says uh, every production of genius must be the production of enthusiasm. That is my mantra, and I can attest that to be true. Anyway, that's that's my spiel, and so I will stop it. And if we want to have a conversation about this, I'm certainly open to uh, to doing that. Love to hear your thoughts and uh, concerns. Any kind of insights? Any innovators out there? Russ, do you want to become a faculty? You'll get a lot more freedom, right? <laughs> Well, that, that would be good. Uh, I am a victim of the comfortable, meaning uh, APL has been pretty comfortable. I've been there 16 years, and now I'm a uh, an instructor in the Whiting School of Engineering, and I'm getting drawn into helping to revise their uh, Foundations of Algorithms course. So that's, yeah, I'm kind of stuck here for now. <laughs> Otherwise, I would be interested in talking about what it's like at the faculty level. I know that there are certain more uh, freedoms available as far as uh, innovation and things like that. You know, I, it's you probably have the same pressures though. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that. Is that right? You're, you're there to be a faculty member. You're not there to be an inventor. I'm guessing. I wonder if silence is acquiescence or a microphone not working either way. No, no, what is it? Alan might have some comments on this, right? Alan has balanced it nicely, right? He's, he's a very successful researcher, right? Doing great things. I think that the job at universities is very diverse and not well defined. Uh, you can you're supposed to do certain things at a sufficient level, but you have a great freedom to emphasize whatever you want to. Um, what are your um, business plans for this venture? Ah, good question. So our business plans are uh, being run by Syntegra Corporation. And so that is a uh, an over, overseas corporation. They are looking, I, I don't want to go too much into strategy because I haven't cleared that with the CEO, but the, um, you know, the overall goal is not to be a company that produces these things. The overall goal is to find other companies that can scale up to a very uh, large distribution and share and or you know further license the technology to to large organizations there's actually a, a huge business right now in they, they call it uh ire which is isolated recovery environments and what isolated reco recovery environments are are giant data center kinds of backup solutions things that are meant to counter ransomware but they're focused on the back end stuff you know this the uh, software as a service saas stuff the uh, cloud-based backups things like that and uh these these companies these products these solutions are, are multi-millions of dollars you know they they go into the data center and uh they do backups and recoveries of the data center kinds of things but they don't address the endpoints right now because they can't address the endpoints right now there is no good endpoint solution so one possible avenue is to partner with somebody who is doing that sort of thing to be able to offer a comprehensive enterprise-wide recovery service and uh, and solution, such that uh, you know ultimately if we get to a point where we can push a button and recover enterprise, that would be you know an amazing thing. Don't think it's ever going to get there, but if you can get close, that would be pretty cool. 
So I would say that's kind of the direction that, that we're going in right now. Uh, we are definitely, or Syntegra rather, is definitely pre-startup, pre-funding, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, so that's that's kind of where it is. It's, it's still in the very uh, early phases. I would think um, recovery would be much easier in a, a system that was as virtual as possible. Because in, in a virtual system, just copying the bits should recover the system. And, and maybe you could have a client which was entirely unmutable that would simply connect to the virtual environment. That what, is a, what would you think of a strategy like that? that? That is a very good strategy in cases where virtualization is possible. So for a lot of desktop applications, we have companies out there like Citrix, I think VMware has offerings and things like that, where they actually can push a a corporate environment to the end user through a virtual means, such that the user can bring their own device, they can have pretty much anything running, and they will get the corporate image, and they can run, you know, approved applications, fully licensed, everything like that on the local box. If anything happens, of course, you can revert to a virtual snapshot, or you just push a brand new image. What that can't solve is uh, companies and organizations that don't invest in that infrastructure. So to have that virtualization capability, you have to buy the Citrix solution. You have to buy the VMware solution. You have to re-architect essentially years worth of organic evolution of your enterprise. So that means all the laptops, all the conference room computers, all the HRs, all the kiosks and things would have to suddenly change to this virtual model, right? So it has its place. So if you can do it, that's fine. But then you look at the kind of embedded applications that you can't virtualize easier. We're talking about hospital x-ray machines. We're talking about oil and gas uh, control systems. We're talking about even things that go into, say, weapons platforms or things like that, all right? Those things might not be able to support virtualization. They might be more of a bare metal kind of thing. And also we're talking about the uh, you know mom and pop business that's still running a Windows 95 box, you know, gateway PC. Remember gateway computers? Yeah, they look like cows. Yeah, those people are not going to be able to run virtual environments, much less invest in it. But something like this would be able to get that base platform back up and running quickly in the event of some sort of a ransomware attack. Just to be clear, we're not proposing this as a replacement for backup solutions. You still need your cloud-based backup in the event that you delete a file or something like that. You know, you don't want to do a full OS restore just to get one file back. All right, that's that's too much. So, but instead, we can work with cloud-based backups. So, if you have your cloud backup, your Code 42, your crash plan, whatever it is people are using, Carbon Black, I think. Uh, you can uh, use that to to do your routine in instance backups but if something disastrous happens you can fall back on this kind of solution that we have which will get your platform back from which you can then do further data recovery can you comment on the security aspects of your um system um what is trusted what encryption is used for example yeah, happy to talk about that. And uh, I can kind of whiteboard this. I, I do this a lot with my students. So we will launch Microsoft Paint, MS Paint Adventures. Here we go. And I'll share the screen again. Incidentally, I'm interested to know if anybody that does online teaching, what are the tools that you use to, to be able to? illustrate concepts and things like that live. So basically, if you have your, you know, your basic disk, okay, and so this disk has to be an Opal drive, all right? And what what is trusted in here? Oh, let's talk about it. What you trust is you trust the Opal firmware, and the password is to the actual drive area, so the 
Opal Drive has ranges. They correspond to partitions, but they're for the hard drive. Okay. And so each range can be password protected with an individual password. In our particular solution, we have ranges. We have two ranges. We have ranges for the um, yeah, for this, the Armor software itself. And then we all also have ranges for the keying material. And we also have range for the vault. Okay, the vault changes from read only to read write, depending on whether you're doing a backup or not. The Armor software, the keying material also goes uh, read only, read write, depending on whether you have to refresh the key, but the software itself is always kept at read only. What we trust is we trust the Opal firmware. All right, so if somebody gets into the Opal firmware and puts a back door there and says leak the password or whatever, you know, all bets are off. But the point of trusted computing is to kind of minimize the trust base. And so we feel that trusting a particular hard drive firmware is actually a, uh, a better plan than say trusting anything running inside of Microsoft Windows that can be corrupt or compromised or things like that. It's all about reducing the attack surface. We also have a feature where we can do unattended backups. And the unattended backups, recognizing that it takes like 40 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes to do a backup and verification. I actually have this system come on in the middle of the night when I'm not around and it does its own backup and it shuts itself down. Well, to do that backup, we have to unlock the vault. And so to do that, we trust the TPM to reveal the vault password so that when the Armour software comes up, it proves to the TPM that, hi, it's me, Armour, I'm in control of the system. The TPM says, yes, you pass all the measurements, so I'm going to give you the password. It reveals the vault password, we unlock the vault, we do the backup, and then we shut down, all right? So we're also trusting the TPM. Okay, we're trusting you know, the TPM to manage the secret, to not reveal that secret unless the correct software is in, uh, involved in control of the platform. And uh, of course, you know, TPMs can, pe people have plus or minus views on TPMs, but it's very useful to us. Actually, I would say that we, we actually use more of the TPM than Windows 10 does. Windows 10 uses certain platform registers. We actually use more registers than that. So we actually have a little bit tighter security than they do for that reason. But of course, that's only up to the point that I run into a problem. Then I have to say, I can't use that PCR anymore. It varies too much. So let's take that out of the mix. Other, other trusted things, of course, you trust the backup software. And currently we are using software from the CloneZilla project to do the actual image software and recovery in cases where we can't use CloneZilla, we revert to CAT and DD. So in the case of BitLocker, I'm actually backing up BitLocker drives here. Uh, BitLocker is encrypted. So rather than try to decrypt that or anything, I just DD that thing to uh, Facebook's Z standard compression algorithm. So that's a, that's a pretty, Pretty new entry in the compression uh, area, but it's actually, it works pretty well. And by the way, I would say also, since you all are here, is BitLocker encryption, it is, it is block by block, meaning that blocks, however big they are, are encrypted independent of other blocks, such that if you change uh, one part of BitLocker, you're not affecting the entire encryption blob, you're, you're affecting only one small part of it. And therefore I can actually get deltas that are very small because it's only uh, keeping track of the blocks that have actually changed since the last time I did the backup. So I think in a way that, that might actually be a security risk on BitLocker because one of the things with encryption is you would not like it to be known to the adversary where changes are taking place in data, because that can reveal some information. But due to operational limitations of Microsoft, BitLocker makes it very clear where changes are being made, at least on the block level. 
and where changes are not being made. So even if you don't have the ac access to the BitLocker key, you could probably look at a couple of BitLocker images and, and tell what's happening from session to session. You know, oh, that guy installed software. Oh, that guy didn't install software, but he created a document. You know, things like that. That that may reveal a lot of information. These are the things Microsoft doesn't tell you, but you find out when you try to do something like this. So that's a that's our spiel. I guess this art session wasn't as interesting or involved as I thought it might be, but be it as it may. Are there any, any more questions? Yeah, I have a quick one. <clears throat> So sort of as you see this this response to ransomware become more popular, is there like an increase in prevalence of like what I guess I would characterize as patient adversaries? That is to say an adversary that will put the ransomware on your machine, but then wait like, you know, maybe 30 to 60 days before activating it remotely. Because I feel like that could potentially deal with, you know, regular backups if they don't go back far enough or make them a lot more expensive. This This is a fear that, that we that we live with and this is the reason armor makes multiple days worth of backups uh, the idea is that you get infected at some point in time but the infection doesn't detonate or blow up or get activated until some other point in time and ideally you get you, you can recover before the detonation point but it may have already taken hold of, of many things or what have you. Ideally, you can get before the infection point. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, criminals that do ransomware are often desperate for money. And they don't have the patience uh, or fortitude to invest in long duration attacks like what you're discussing which means just because they're not doing it doesn't mean they can't do it just means they're not doing it there was a very interesting uh, i went to this uh, energy facility contractors group meeting this week where we discussed ransomware and things that affect the department of energy and they had a nice exchange between they actually documented a guy from the fbi came to talk and he documented an actual email exchange between a victim and the attacker and from that exchange, it was very clear that the attacker was solely motivated by money. You know, eventually the attacker came and wanted $500,000. The victim responded by saying, essentially, you know, we're a small shop. We didn't make many changes and all of our developers have backups on their own local hard drive. It's not worth 500,000 to us. Eventually they negotiated back and forth until they got down to, to $10,000 as the ransom that was paid. But during the exchange, the focus was entirely on money and urgency. You know, do this by Friday, do this by this point. We need to get this Bitcoin in place. We need to have this happen. And so generally speaking, the, the, the ransomware actors are interested in a very short time, very quick payout. And so they will drop, uh, you know, ransomware on your system that will start encrypting right away. And generally speaking, you know, even for the ones that go low and slow, low and slow is probably on a week long basis, not a month long basis. There's also something to be said about signatures being detected. And so if somebody drops, you know, the longer a piece of software sits on a machine, the more open it is to heuristic detection and also the more open it is for somebody else to discover the problem, write a signature for it, update your signatures, and then boom, you detect it and shut it down before it has a chance to work. So there's really this kind of, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is, but there might be some, it would be interesting to know the answer here. You know, what, what is the average uh, from dropper to detonation time of ransomware? That would be something worth knowing. These are all interesting considerations, and it is useful to keep in mind that adversaries do have the option of um, very long-term patient attacks. And there have been some notable examples where 
malware was planted over a year in advance in anticipation of a certain event. Um, it seems like there are trade-offs on this on this strategy for doing this, but it's something that we have to consider. Yeah, it it absolutely is. I want to throw another wrench in the works. Uh, Windows, so I, I log in remotely to APL, and we have active domain credentials that expire after 30 days. So if I don't log in for 30 days, then my machine will effectively be kicked off the network. All right. Normally, that doesn't matter. But let's say I got ransomware and I recovered to a point in time 31 days ago. See, now I'm pulling back the credentials that are 31 days old and my machine will be kicked off the system. It won't be accepted onto the network. So, so yeah, attackers have motivations for, you know, recent, recent uh, you know, do things quickly. But organizations also have this motivation to, uh, we can't restore from too long ago or else that machine's just going to be dead in the water anyway. So that's interesting. I mean, it seems like the psychology of the adversary almost prevents being patient with something or ransomware. Um, it seems like another major contribution of the work you're sharing here is this idea of like deltas. I, I know that deltas, you know, already exist in other contexts, but it seems to me like you could do more with these deltas than just create like a backup system. What about sort of having an intrusion detection system analyze deltas, for example, like the ones you're creating? That's an excellent point. Because we are making immutable images of the whole hard drive, that would have a profound forensic uh, capability that, that could be extracted from that. You could even view this as a way. So long ago at APL, we had somebody doing some really bad stuff on a computer uh, involving images and things that I won't get into. But one of the issues was they, they prosecuted it through a criminal uh, channel, but to do that, they had to have evidence it, because obviously the person discovered that somebody was onto them. So they went and erased everything. But with something like armor, you actually preserve those images. You preserve everything, deleted files, unallocated blocks, everything, right? This could have a, a forensic benefit as well. So if you say you had this on all your employee systems and something happened and you needed to understand what did their hard drive look like three weeks ago, you could easily get there by you know extracting these images and doing things that way. And, and even if employees are not doing anything bad, if there's some advanced malware and we think it took root three weeks ago, we could go back to an image three weeks ago and find out, all right, what's the evidence that maybe this is there, maybe it's not there, and maybe it showed up and then went away or something. We, we could do that too. So that, yeah, there is definitely a forensics application here as well. Well, thank you very much. It was an interesting talk. Um, we'll be back in two weeks when Josiah Dykstra will talk about myths in cybersecurity. He's going to talk about part of um, a book he's written, recently published with some others. Uh, I was told there is something on the chat and I am trying to. Can somebody check the chat and see what's there? Uh, there's a question. Um, would an attack surface be when the drive goes? into read write or is there protection for older backups that make them not read write yes so when the drive goes into read write it is in control the whole platform is in control of the armor operating system so yeah that is a fear of of what happens so as long as the armor operating system is running correctly and it's basically it's a very stripped down basic fedora system I mean, there's no X windows, there's nothing. Uh, that's that's how we're sure. That, and if you try to control C out of anything, it, it shuts down the computer. Uh, that's that's what our defense is when the system goes into read write. When the system powers on from scratch, it comes up in a read only state until you enter a password to make it read write. But by default, you know, power on scenario, Opal is configured to come up with a vault in a read only state.
Well, thank you again. Uh, that right. concludes uh, today's session. We'll Thanks. post the video on the CDL website. Nice talking to everybody.